Randy Kay here. We all go through struggles at times, and I want to share with you through stories and insights and interviews with others how much God loves you. He loves you immensely, and that's what I hope you will hear through our interviews and what we have to share with you. Thanks for staying tuned. Here we go. Welcome to this episode of Revelations from Heaven. My guest today, Mike Garut, has a story that began at the age of 13 when he died and he entered the space that is the afterlife. It changed his life. Today, he is a pastor, has been in ministry with his wife for 40 years. But then later in life, he got saved. And then what happened is he had a vision with Jesus Christ. He was revealed the end times, and we'll be talking about that as well. That has been the mainstay of his ministry about the end times. So Mike, it's great to have you with us today. Thank you. It's just such an honor to be here with you and to be able to share the good news of the gospel and what God is doing in this hour. Uh, He truly changes our lives in supernatural ways. And uh, it's just a privilege to be with you today, sir. Well, likewise, uh, my brother. And uh, this, you have a a story that really transcends from childhood into adulthood uh, in a profound way, because we're in a, what I I have termed a Kairos moment. That is, we are in the end stages of uh, of history. But your uh, journey began uh, at an early age. And uh, you had uh, lost your uh, father. And then at uh, 13, uh, you had died. So uh, tell us what led up to that, please. All right. Well, we'll just begin. uh, My first near-death encounter uh, was when I was three and a half years old. And we were in Seward, Alaska. And we had been visiting. And uh, this is the first time that I heard God's voice supernaturally. The only other uh, time I don't remember, my mother had shared with my sister uh, when I was two and a half years old, we were at church and the pastor had given an altar call to be born again. And nobody had got up. She said that I had got up, went down there at two and a half. And the pastor asked me what I was there for. And I told him I wanted to be born again. So when I see that, I passed many years, so I want you to know that was a supernatural move of God. And so I accepted the Lord, but don't remember anything else. Of course, I didn't remember that. My mother, This is just something my mother told my sister. But at three and a half, we were walking through the woods and living on a military base. And uh, I ran ahead, and I fell in a big... Uh, thing of water where the garbage had been made for the military base. And anyway, it was full of water and I fell in the water. And as I fell in, I hear the Lord's voice. And he said, don't be afraid. It was very calming, very stilling. He says, don't be afraid. You're going to be okay. He said, there's two wooden crates in the here, put them on top of each other, stand on top of it, and you will be okay. And so, you know, I think about that, how, what an amazing feat to, at that age. I didn't know how to swim, to be able to do that. I remember the water was very murky and dark, but I saw the crates and I stood up on them. And my sister had caught up with me and she was trying to pull me up out of the water. I fell back in. And uh, the Lord said, it's okay. You're going to be fine. Do the same thing. And I did. And when I stood up that time, my mother was there. So she pulls me out of the water and takes me in and cleans me up and puts me in bed because I was very cold. It was near the time of winter up there. And so that was my first near-death experience. And I never forgot it. It's burned forever in my spirit. Um, from that point on is when I really, Brother Randy, began to hear the voice of God. And uh, some people will ask, well, what does he sound like? Well, we can go back to the time of Elijah when he was this prophet who had always heard God. And he, 
he had ran and he was heard the loud noises outside, the crackling of thunder and lightning and all these things, earthquake. But he sure heard the Lord speak and say, why are you here? So when he went out and the Lord said a still small voice came to him, I would like to say that more of a stilling, calm voice. That's what it was mm, to me. I and like so that. His, his voice was very comforting, so full of love. It was like you wanted to hear it. You, you, you responded to it. And so that was my first journey with the Lord. And from that point on, nothing uh, major. Just my family was very loving. My mom and dad, they always took us to church. Uh, they were so kind, uh, just full of the love of God. Uh, then things began to change when I was seven. My mom and dad separated. And that's a long story why, so we won't go into it today. It was nothing immoral. It was uh, an influence from another pastor. Uh, but anyway... Uh, so they separated when I was seven, and I lived with my sister, and I lived with my father. Uh, we stayed up there in Alaska on the homestead. We were homesteaders, commercial fishermen. And so uh, by the time I was nine years old was my other near-death experience. It was quite uh, traumatic. Uh, my father uh, was killed in a hunting accident. The man who killed him and a boy 13 years old, where uh, he worked for my father on the commercial fishing sites that we had. And uh, he had went and borrowed enough money from, or actually charged the guns, $6,000 worth in the co-op. It was a cannery. So you could buy whatever you wanted, paid at the end of the year. So my dad found out about it and uh, told him there's no law up in Alaska. Uh, the nearest law enforcement was 50 some miles away. And anyway, it was just the way it was back then. So my dad told him either get the money back, bring the guns back and recompense for it, or I will have to turn you into the police. And he was going back up to Anchorage in a month to make a cap payment. So anyway, we're, we're getting ready to go hunting, my first hunting trip. And we're on our way out to take my uncles and my brother supplies for the moose hunt. We were all out there, uh, all my family uh, for the year. And this man, uh, George Steele, had asked my father, well, can I go and get a moose for my family? And dad uh, was just so kind. And he said, sure, even though they had words and had gotten in a couple scuffles that month he knew it was how important it was to feed the family so he let him go well on the way there god intervened and, and had my dad stop the car in the middle of the road had me get out and and said i couldn't go he didn't feel good about it in his heart he said you just can't go today of course i was upset i was nine and we hadn't got to spend a lot of time together because he worked all the time but anyway, I walked back to my aunt and uncle's house, my dad's brother, and about an hour or so went by and my uncle Oscar pulled up and came up to the door and uh, told that my dad had been murdered and Bill Dick Brazel's sons was also dead. And so I know that if I would have been there, then I also would have perished with them. So that was my second time uh, of having a close encounter of death. So your uh, father had a premonition or a word from the Lord did. that yeah. that uh, something was going to happen and he wanted to protect you from that. That's correct. He, he really did. And, and I could see in his face uh, that it was real. And, and I, I sensed that, you know, all right. And so at that point, uh, you know, when you lose a parent at that age, I'm just speaking to the audience, uh, and a, a lot of people that don't know this, unless you've experienced it, it just really makes you numb. 
Nothing else matters. My whole world was gone. My mother was gone. I uh, did back down to Oregon. Uh, loving mother, uh, great lady. Uh, but uh, my dad was gone. Uh, mm. And uh, and he was your was, primary parent at the time. He was. Yeah. He was. And such a, such a wonderful, loving father. Um, really portrayed the father's heart. I, I can say that about him. Uh, to this day, he was the best. So at that point, um, of course, the devastation was there. And so the next thing I knew uh, at 10 years old, my brother came and got me and uh, he was 10 years older than me. And he was already gone out of the family. And my mom had come back to Alaska, but I was 10 and, and my friend, Bill, uh, we would drink every weekend. And so at 10 years old, I started drinking and smoking. And uh, nothing seemed to matter. I always thought about the Lord. I loved Jesus. Um, but, the, I, you know, I couldn't figure things out at that age. All I knew is I was broken. And uh, I, I was miserable inside. And so I went to, I went to drinking and, uh, and you were how old at this eight, point where you started? I was 10, 10 years old. Wow. 10 years old. And so it was no problem, uh, getting alcohol, uh, especially at Bill's house. His daddy was an alcoholic. So anyway, at, at that point, uh, after a couple of years in Alaska, winters were very hard. Mom brought us back down to Oregon. And at that point, um, she was working two jobs. Uh, we were, I was 11 years old. I never saw her except for maybe once a week, uh, maybe on a Sunday. She had quit going to church because she worked most of the time. And uh, I met friends, skipped school most of the time. And, and uh, I just, well, there was always beer and alcohol around. And then I continued on uh in that uh, every weekend. Then at 12 years old, I was offered LSD before I'd done any other type of drug and I took it. And so I started my journey taking LSD and other psychedelics at 12 years old. And uh, then I started smoking pot and uh, this is important to the testimony I'm fixing to give at my death. Um, I started taking drugs very heavily so at that point I was very, I was sad, uh, broken, no family life. So I told my mother, I'm going back up to Alaska to see my uncle, uh, who I got to live with for a little bit and, uh, precious couple, very close to them. So I moved in with them and, uh, this is when, uh, I really had the, death experience and so i'm going to share that uh, we had gotten up early my uncle owned a cold storage plant uh, which we western dressed salmon we would go down to the beach net sites and get them and bring them back to there and, and he would ship they shipped them all over the united states so he said grab the gas cans and so i grabbed the gas cans and i filled them up with gasoline from our 55 gallon drums and put them in the back of the car and we went down uh, to the cold storage plant and we had a Jeep pickup where we would go pick up the fish in. And he said, go ahead and siphon the gas in the, in the Jeep. And so I did and uh, started my process and I'd watched it done before, but I had never done it. And he didn't take the time to, to show me how he just figured I knew. And so I'm got the gas hose in my mouth and I'm sucking it in like that and it started coming out and I put it in the tank well it quit well I didn't really think and there was still a lot of gas in the line and so I sucked it in like that again to get mm. to pull it in and all the gas went in my lungs oh my goodness and I've heard other people say uh, you know when you're going to die and I knew instantly that it was over. Mm -hmm. And uh, first thing I said was because of my mother, 
had always drilled in me, uh, son, if you ever think you're going to die, uh, ask Jesus to forgive you and, of your sins. And so my first thought was, and because of my couple, last couple years or so, <sighs> going in the wrong direction, I said, Jesus, forgive me of all my sins. Because I'd already accepted him as Savior, but I didn't know what it meant to have him as Lord. And uh, so I fell over into the ground. I got sick. And uh, next thing I know, I'm standing outside of my body. And uh, I looked at my body laying on the ground, and I said, I've died. And it was obvious. And then everything around me was vibrant. Uh, life had come into me in such a way, it was overwhelming. It was eternal life. And everything was so crisp, clear. And as I looked around, I was still on the ground at this time. I looked around at everybody and everybody was doing what they're doing. Uh, nobody seemed to notice because the cold storage plant was next to the main road down to the cannery. Uh, I'm laying there next to it and nobody was paying attention. I was laying there dead and, and nobody seemed to notice. So you were, uh, uh, you were a third party to your, your body at this point, looking around. Yeah. Yes, wow. I was. And so as I looked down and I looked at my hands and I noticed that my body on earth looked just like my spiritual body. And I thought that was amazing. And the one thing that I noticed, Brother Randy, was I could see out of both eyes. I was born blind in my right eye. And so I could see out of both eyes. Everything was so beautiful. And I'm standing there. And so I start going up. And, and it wasn't uh, a fast ascension. It was, in fact, very slow, uh, 10 feet about every three, four seconds. And as I continued to go up in the air, I got about a hundred feet in the air to where I was even with the bluff that ran along the coastline there on the Kenai Peninsula. And I looked over at the school and then I looked up and, and saw the Lehman family and the three boys out playing in the yard. And I noticed then I could see a long way because uh, they were a half a mile away. And I thought, wow, uh, there, there's Mark and, and his brothers, uh, Wayne and uh, Lauren, and they were all outside. And so I'm looking down. And as I'm looking down, I'm watching. And the thing that I probably noticed the most was is everybody was busy. Everybody was doing what they normally would do, and everything was all normal, but everything was so beautiful. It was crisp and it was clear out. And uh, I thought to myself, wow, Lord, what a beautiful world you have made. And I looked over to the right and I saw Mount McKinley peeking up over, over the ocean and because uh, it was a long ways away and you couldn't see it from the ground. And I noticed Mount McKinley. And I thought, wow. So when I turned around and I looked towards everything, I hear the Lord speak to me. Same stilling, calm, loving voice. And he said, son, do you want to come to heaven or do you want to stay? And it was at that point, Brother Randy, I responded with, Lord, I'm only 13. I guess I will stay. And and I'm amazed that that, that question was really asked. Why not just take me on to heaven? Of course, there's a purpose for my life. And I said, Lord, I guess I'll stay. And he said, okay. It wasn't, are you sure? Uh, or anything like that. It was just, okay. It was accepted. And uh, and at that point, I, I didn't see the Lord. But he was behind me. And it was just, like when his voice came down, it was so 
moving inside. I, and I stopped at that point and I started slowly going back down to my body, the same way that I went up in the air. And I got there and I'm looking at it. And one thing that I noticed was how frail it really was. Um, and the thoughts came to me, what now? Because my life was so awful. I was so lost. I was so numb. Um, my only hope, my only comfort was Jesus. He had showed me so much love and compassion in my rough times. Always faithful to speak to my heart. Always comforting me. Uh, always giving me hope. And so I stepped back down in my body. And when I lifted up, I noticed I couldn't see out of my right eye no more. And I couldn't breathe. Uh, I couldn't get enough air to get up. So I crawled over to the cold storage doorway, a little platform there. And my cousin came running out and saw me because he was up there from California working with my uncle on the boat with us commercial boat and uh he said what happened and i pointed to my lungs gas and i passed out well when i woke up i was down in my uncle uh, danny's basement in bed they put me to bed uh, nearest hospital was 188 miles north to anchorage on a gravel road took hours and hours to get there uh, so basically up there, unless you're cut wide open or shot or something, you just toughed it out. Wow. <laughs> so I laid in bed for weeks because I couldn't get enough air to get out. It took me six months before I could breathe in a full breath of air. Mm. And it took me years for my body really to recover. So it was very devastating in that area. And so at that point, really, in my life, I was so uh, broken. And so I'm thinking, well, I died. Uh, the Lord spared me. Life will get better. And so I kind of carried that hope. And uh, it wasn't long after that that I went back down to Oregon, where my mother was, uh, she had bought me a ticket, wanted to see me. So I went back to Oregon. And from that time on, I would probably say, Brother Randy, uh, the next 10 years was just hell on earth. Mm. Just devastating. Um, I got back shooting up drugs. I started shooting up crystal meth. And I was right at the end of my 13th year, year and on into 14 15, taking all the other drugs. It was it was just trying to fill that void of numbness that was deposited in me by the death of my father. Um, you could talk to me about Jesus. Friends would, or people would come by, witness. We called them Jesus freaks back then. Mm. And, and, uh, and I would talk to them, and I would agree with them. And my sister sometimes would have talks with me about the Lord because she knew I was very heavily addicted, and she was concerned about me. Um, she would let me stay. I had nowhere to live most of that time. At the, from the age of 15 on up, I was on my own. And anyway, so I continued that lifestyle of, of brokenness and partying and just uh, ended up um, getting the car wrecks, ended up in hospital, my head caved in all the way around here, just smashed and laying there thinking about life and, and, and just wishing. I began to get an understanding 
uh, of how bad I needed God. And I wanted God, but I didn't know how to get there. So at that point, uh, at the age of 17, I had uh, actually shot up so much meth that my heart was basically exploding and, and I was at the verge of dying. And uh, I knew it. I, I called on the Lord. He was faithful. He kept me alive. So at that point, I continued. I started selling drugs. I worked whenever I could. The recession was very heavy in the 70s. Uh, I worked and because I'd worked ever since I was little. Uh, picked fish when I was five, six years old out of the boat. Pulled roots on the homestead and drove the dozer around and cut wood. And helped with the sawmill. So I'd always worked hard. So work was something that I uh, enjoyed doing. And, uh, but I sold drugs to help with my drug problem and sold drugs to a federal narcotics agent, ended up in prison. Mm. And you were at what age now? I was 17. Right. 17 years of age. And what's interesting, just a, a brief pause here is now, yeah. because you had lost your life at 13 yes. uh, through in the ingestion of uh, copious uh, amounts of gasoline. Yeah, and absolutely. God gave you the choice whether you would s stay with him and eventually be in heaven and not return to earth or, or yes. uh, return. You had chosen that. And then you said that really what, what kept you going was, was Jesus uh, during your childhood. Yes. Uh, and your father was a believer in Jesus? He was. Uh Love the Lord very much. Very devout man. He he worked about 16 hours a day, but there's times I would see him uh, there sitting by the wood stove reading the Bible till 2, 3 in the morning. Uh, he loved the word. He was, and he was just full of love and kindness. People loved him because he was always helped everybody. In Alaska at that time, there was a lot of needs, a lot of, you know, homesteaders, so we, we depended on each other. So yes, he was a devout Christian, loved God, uh, was very uh, heartbroken about mom leaving. He went back down to talk to her one time and uh, had hopes they would get back together. So yeah, he was. He was, he was, he was a believer in Jesus. Um, our whole family was. Uh, mom loved the Lord. Uh, we had a pastor friend because my mom had been married once before, told them that their marriage wasn't sanctioned by God, and that's why they divorced. And he kept on them until they just split up. Mm. And uh, such a tragedy. Yes, and you were now addicted to drugs and on this spiral yes. down. And uh, it seemed the, the Lord had his hand on you now that, that he had returned you uh, to this life. He was obviously going to save you because that that yeah. happened but um he he had he was he was going to ultimately give you a message about the end times but yes sir first he had to deliver you of of this extraordinary addiction and you were arrested by this narcotics officer that you dealt drugs to and uh now you're in prison now i'm in prison i had one supernatural experience i think that your viewers would like to hear if i may share that please um i turned 18 in, in jail i was in like solitary confinement it was a 1942 navy brig they put inside the county jail real small little compartments it was always black no lights um got out one time a day to take a shower so anyway i'm in there and i'm coming off all these heavy drugs and I'm laying in bed, and I hear a clock. And as the clock is ticking, I thought, that's really strange, because the nearest clock is 50 feet away around a corner in the sheriff's office. And I noticed that my heart was beating funny, and I put my finger on my wrist to feel my heartbeat, and my heartbeat was beating the same as the clock. And I'm laying there, and it's pitch black. 
Uh, and I said, that's, I just thought it was really strange. Well, I look over, then my heart stops. And I thought, not again. Uh, so I look at the end of my bed, Brother Randy, and I saw this black figure. It was darker than the blackness. And he said, I've come to get you. It's time. And I knew what it was. I said, no, you can't have me. He says, yes, I've been sent to get you. And my heart's not beating. And at this time, I'm, I'm in the spirit realm, if I may say. And I'm looking and we're having this conversation. I've come to get you. And I'm saying no. And I'm getting very uh, emphatic with him. I'm saying, I am not going with you. I will not go with you. And, he's, and then he's arguing, yes, you will. I've come to get you. And I don't know how long that took. It seemed like an eternity to be in that place. And so after a little while, uh, the spirit just left and my heart started beating again. But I couldn't hardly breathe. And so I'm scared. And I'm yelling for the police officer because my heart was, was kept stopping. And I said, I need to go to the hospital. I didn't share the supernatural thing. I just said, I can't breathe. My heart's stopping, racing. So he didn't want to. Finally, after arguing and threatening him to own the place, he did. <laughs> he, uh, I said, you wait till tomorrow when somebody else comes on shift if I make it, you know. So anyway, they take me to the hospital. And Brother Randy, they get me there, and they hook up an EKG machine to me. And it just shuts down. Hmm. It just stops. And they, the nurse, she says, well, that's never happened before. And so she keeps trying, and no. So they unhooked that one from me, from the tabs, and they bring over. They had another one. They hooked it to me, turned it on, and it started, and it just shut down. Mm. And uh, she looked at me, and she said, what's going on with you? Like she was picking up on something. And I said, I don't know. I just can't breathe. My heart's racing. I've been addicted to drugs for the last several years. I am so on and so forth. So they gave me a shot of something. Call me down. My heart started beating normal. And uh, back to the jail cell I went. So when I was in there, I had two dreams from God. I think this is important. What this does for the moms, the dads, or even maybe a person that may hear me today uh, being on drugs. I want you to listen uh, to this because this is very important. I had a dream one night that I was working in a particular place and I saw it, saw the place I was working at, the job I was doing, I was driving a forklift from one department to another. And then that it quit and I went to another one. And in that dream, I saw myself getting out of jail. And I saw myself at the probation office. And as I handed in my report and paid my fine, the probation officer picked up a pack of papers and put my, my paper I handed in underneath. And then in the dream, I saw 30 days had passed from the time I got out. And when I was put on probation, uh, God's mercy, I was facing 20 years in the federal pen. And uh, the judge dropped it to a class B felony and gave me probation and six months. Fine and a fine. 
So that was a miracle of God. It was showing me mercy, loving mercy. You had this prophetic dream that was God was giving yes. you that you would actually yeah. receive mercy and a lesser sentence and be out of prison on parole. Yeah. And this is and, this is following this this demon standing at the foot of you, yes. who was saying, "I'm I've I've got an assignment now on you to take your life." That's right. And you were calling back to the demon, kind of wrestling with the demon, if you will, that yes. um, no. And did you have any inkling at that point that the one only one that could save you was was Jesus? Oh yes, I my rela <laughs> You know, I know some, I guess, for lack of better words, religious people have a hard time with this part because we've always heard that the only prayer that God hears is the sinner's prayer of repentance to get born again. But the Lord had always been there for me, uh, and I'd always called on him, and he had always answered and helped me out of some really drastic things. So at, at the end of that dream... Uh, I saw that and it was over. Well, I get out of jail, Randy, 30 days exactly passes by and they arrest me. And they said, you haven't handed in your probation paper or paid your fine. And I, and I said, yes, sir, I have. And so I got, they take me to jail. Now this is 20 years facing. And so I said, listen, I didn't go into the dream or in any detail. I just said, would you please call the probation officer and have him pick up that stack of papers on his right and look on the bottom of it? I believe my paper's there. And they looked at me real funny, but I, I had been getting in trouble since I was 13 years old and they they knew me and, and I'd always been respectful uh, to the police. I had, now, I never hated the law, even though the man that murdered my father and the boy, 13, got probation and went to work for the governor of Alaska, got no time. Mm. So I didn't hate the law. I saw injustice. But I didn't hold it against somebody that didn't have anything to do with it. So anyway, I and they did. They called and he checked. And he said, it's there. Let him go. And so that dream that God gave me came to pass. So you had a word of knowledge from I had a word God of knowledge that at the bottom of the stack, you know, was your paper to excuse you from. Uh, that's correct. Yeah, that that's amazing. It is amazing. Well, the other dream came to pass too. It's two years later. I was in Wyoming living with my sister. Went to work for a company called Western Oil Dual Corporation, Watco. And I was in charge of shipping and receiving, driving a forklift, taking the parts to the other part. And I'm driving through from one to the other on the forklift. And that dream hit me. This is what I saw in prison. And the Lord said, I'm with you. Mm. Wow. Jesus. You heard that voice again. Yes. Wow. It was so real. Excuse me. Uh, I knew God's hand was on me. And so at that time, I wasn't uh, doing drugs no more, smoking pot, and drinking. But that's so minor compared to what I did for so many years. It's all bad. None of us good. Uh but I just really slacked off the other. And, and I, I was thinking about life then and wanting God. I wanted the Lord. And I'd tell the Lord, I want you. Help me. And I went to church with my mother when I was 19. I got very sick. She had gotten married, and they were separated at that time. And anyway, I made my way to her house, and I— she put me to bed. And so that Sunday, she goes, would you go to church with me? She was back going to church. And I said, well, yeah, sure. So I went to church. Assemblies of God Church down on the corner. And uh, got up, went down, and responded to the altar call. 
and just wept. 19 years old. I got up. <sighs> Nobody came over to me. Of course, I was skinny, druggy then, long hair. At least I was clean that day. <laughs> and uh, But nobody came and uh, said, oh, we're so glad. Pastor didn't even come over. And uh, I was really disappointed, heartbroken for the lack of compassion. Because uh, I, I always loved people. I've always loved people. I cared uh, about people. And... Uh, so I went back home with my mother, and I, I stayed clean a whole week. Uh, sure could have used some follow-up, pastors, if there's anybody out here today listening. Don't ever let that happen. Hmm. People need to be followed up on. That's an important word. And There uh, are those with a gift of pastoring that are not in an official position as a pastor, but you have that heart uh, for people to help them and yes. that's that's an important uh, call you're at what point now you were in at this point i am just at a place of transition uh, -huh. uh i had since i got out of prison i quit shooting up drugs i was just drinking every day mm. uh, heavily um and smoking pot so anyway, at this point, uh, I got in an accident. That's why I ended up in Wyoming. Caught my hand caught in a machine, about tore it off. So I get over there. Well, I come back to Oregon, and I'm 21 now. I'm finding good work. I'm working, drinking, so on and so forth. And so uh, we'll get to the salvation part now. Uh and continued to do that. I moved to another town in Oregon called Hermiston. It's 1978, uh, spring, March of 1978. And uh, I'm going to a party with a friend and uh, that night, and I meet my future wife. And my friends had asked me, a lot of them are getting married, and this is very profound and, and prophetic, really. And they would ask me during my teenage years and later on, when you go get married, because I, I basically didn't date. I just wasn't in my itinerary, I guess. Um, the sexual revolution wasn't really that big of a deal to me. How strange is that? Except I know it was God just watching over me. And I said, well, all I know is I'm going to get married when I'm ready to settle down and I can really take care of a family and I'm going to marry a girl named Debbie and have three children. And I always said that. <laughs> well, that night I meet Debbie, March 21st, <laughs> 1978. We get married July 4th, 1978. We moved right in. I moved right in with her and we had three children together. Wow. And so that's really amazing. So he, yeah, you uh, knew it was going to be a Debbie and well, in advance yeah. of meeting Debbie. I really, I don't know <laughs> where that, I mean, I think the Lord just had me calling it in unaware. Uh, He's got, he has uh, a, his radar uh, yeah. on you for, uh, for, you know, all of your lifetime. Yes, he really has. And so, well, we, we, uh, we get married uh, July 4th, and we're going to the bars and drinking and partying. And uh, it was a Friday night. It was Friday, uh, it was Friday, uh, August the 4th on a Friday night. And I, my wife was so drunk, she couldn't drive, so I told her to pull over. And I changed places with her. And uh, she wanted to drive my new car. Anyway, so I, I go to get out. And there's this man standing there with a shotgun. He'd been hired by the, they sold trailers there and people kept stealing the furniture. So he was hired as a night guard not to let anybody on the grounds. I understand that. But he shoves this gun in my face. And I'm not, I'm not a violent person. In fact, I was always just a happy drunk. 
Okay, I, I didn't like violence, uh, care anything about it. Um, but when he did that, my first thought was my father. This is the kind of man that killed my father. Mm. And I never dealt with that before. I'd never been in that position. And, and I, I didn't really know that that was inside of me. And of course, I'd said some things that I can't share today. And I said, I'm just going to change the places with my wife, get the gun out of my face. And uh, he starts arguing and we're screaming at each other. And my wife sees us getting very elevated. She punches the car, puts gas to it, takes off, throws gravel all over at him, and he shoots at me with the shotgun. And I got so angry, I literally knocked the windshield out of the car with my hand, hitting it. Wow. Well, we got home that night, went to bed, woke up the next morning, Brother Randy, 9.30 in the morning, Saturday, August 5th, the Lord speaks to me. It's time for you to come home, son. The exact words. And I just said out loud, oh, thank God. <laughs> and Debbie, she's in the living room, and I'm bringing her a cup of coffee. She says, What? And I come in there and I said, God just spoke to me and said, it's time for me to come home and give my life to him. And I said, our marriage will never last. Nothing will ever go right if we don't get God in our lives. And she got saved when she was little, but we'd really never talked about the Lord. And she says, you're right. You're absolutely right. <laughs> and, and we both kind of looked at each other and I was so happy. And I called my mom. And, I, and she says, there's a pastor down the road where I visited when I stayed with you last month. Call him. So I called him. And uh, I said, Pastor, I said, uh, my wife and I want to get saved. He said, you what? I said, we want to get saved. We want you to come to our house. We live at 970 Juanita Avenue. <laughs> and he goes, oh, my. I've never had this happen before. <laughs> and uh, I said, give us 30 minutes, right? So I'm cleaning the beer bottles up and the ashtrays and everything. And and we're cleaning up the house. And, and by that time, he gets there, it's 1030. And I said to my wife, I said, we're going to get saved today, honey. I said, but I probably will still smoke pot, right? Because it was so minute. So down, you know, it's, even though it's wrong. Uh and she goes, well, I don't care. You know, like it's, we have no comprehension of spiritual things. Well, he comes, comes in, it's 1030. He said that. Well, let me share a little bit before we pray. He says, you know, times may get rough. And and uh, and I'm thinking, rough? Let me tell you about rough is what I wanted to say. And I, so we listened. And we said, okay, that's fine. We understand. He said, but you can make it through Jesus if you hang on. If you go to church, read your Bible, and pray, God will bring you through anything. And I said, okay, sounds good. So we got down and we, we prayed. Simple sinner's prayer. Forgive me of all my sins. I confess you as Lord, come into my heart. And all of a sudden, I'd always been scared of dying wonder why huh and uh the death i would actually stay up till two or three in the morning at times because i didn't want to go to sleep i was so scared of dying because i knew what was waiting and but as far as anything else in life i really didn't fear anything i knew i could make it you know i've been living on my own so many years you know i'm ready to grab the bull by the horns and make life so anyway i it hit me when I said, Jesus, come in, I felt it roll off me. Super. I felt something roll down my back. And I stood up and I, 
I was smiling and I was so happy. Debbie's crying. She's boohooing on the ottoman. And, and I'm just beside myself with joy. But we both got delivered that day. Hear me. Mm, praise God. Whoever praise you would be listening to me today. Jesus can deliver you. Supernaturally set you free. He, his love and his compassion is for you. He'll reach down from heaven. And he'll break the weight of sin off your life. Just ask him in. He will do the rest. He's faithful to the end. And when that happened, we were just so different. And uh, he stayed a little while. And, and man, we did. he said, come to church Sunday. And, and we did. And I want you to know that that church, we shared our testimony a little bit. Of and that church, we got in revival. For the, it was just amazing what it did uh, for the church. We got baptized in water. We went uh, and then about three weeks later, uh, Debbie's mother sells her house in Pendleton. She's from this area, Northeast Georgia. And Debbie had lived here also uh, growing up. And so Debbie says, you want to move to Georgia? My mom's moving back there. And I said, sure, sounds great to me. <laughs> <laughs> so we pick up stakes and we arrive in Clayton, Georgia, August 21st at 1230 in the afternoon at her aunt's house. And so we get there, we immediately start in church. And uh, totally changed by the power of God, totally liberated. We never wanted to, to smoke again, never wanted to uh, drink again or do anything. And we, we had just, we've been born again. Mm. We were a new creation in Christ. Mm. And now all things were new and of God. And so we embraced that. Immediately started working in the church, teaching Sunday school, youth. Uh, had no idea. I would ever be called to preach. So I forgot to share one important thing. I don't know how much time we got left. Uh, have we got another five minutes? Yes. And I want to get to the, uh, the end times, uh, vision okay. of the encounter with Jesus. As yeah. Well. Yes. Okay. I want to share this part only for the mothers, fathers, or the young people, you feel like there's no way out. I want to share with you right now one of the most compelling love stories that God has for the sinner, that God has for the broken, the fatherless. He is a father to the fatherless. I'm 16 years old. I am very addicted to crystal meth using it every day. And so we decide, me, Randy, Thompson, and a couple other people, we would move to Pocatello, Idaho, which is 400 miles from La Grande, Oregon. We get a job to support our habit. And uh, we get there. And so we've been there a few days, and I wake up one morning, and they're gone. They just run off and leave me. And man, I, I mean, I've been hanging out with Randy and his friends for months, you know, thought they liked me or cared a little bit. I don't know if they couldn't wake me up. I don't know what was going on. You don't have much rationale in that state of mind. So anyway, I thought, oh, well, no big deal. Just one more disappointment in life. So I grabbed my duffel bag, army duffel bag, had a couple of pairs of dirty clothes in it. It's about it. And I started heading out the door and finally find the freeway. Took me a long time. Start hitchhiking back. I get about to Ontario, uh, Idaho, 118 miles from La Grand, And I'm cold. I hadn't ate for days, four or five days at least. I wasn't feeling well. I weighed about 95 pounds. Um, scared, broken, just desperate. 
And it's nighttime. One guy picks me up right before dark and says, if you don't get a ride before dark, you won't get one. And it's cold out. And I'm thinking, oh, God. And because uh, I nearly froze to death before in Alaska. So I understand that I was in dire straits. I look over this bridge and it's got a little spot I could s- squeeze in where the police wouldn't see me and pick me up, put me in jail. And uh, I look up in heaven, all the stars, and it's so beautiful. It reminded me of a night when I would go walking with my mother and father in Alaska on the homestead. Same stars. Beautiful. And I thought, oh, my. I said, Lord, I know you're up there. Jesus, I know you're up there. And I know you love me. But I don't want to sleep underneath that bridge tonight. I'm so cold. I'm so hungry. Would you please send someone to give me a ride, something to eat, a place to stay, and a ride back to the freeway in the morning? And then I just said, thank you, Lord, for hearing me. And I want you to know it was five to ten minutes, this couple in their 40s, maybe early 50s, I just come back from a prayer meeting, Brother Randy. And they pulled over. Now I'm I look awful. I'm bone, skin and bones, long hair, scraggly beard, just looked like death warmed over. They pulled over and they picked me up and they said, I got in the car and they said, Young man, do you believe in God? And all I said was, yes, I do. And they said, well, we've never picked up a hitchhiker before and didn't ever plan on it, but we just came back from a prayer meeting and God told us to pick you up, give you something to eat, a place to stay, and a ride back to the freeway in the morning. Those are the words that came out of their mouth. Wow. When they said that, I said to the Lord, thank you for loving me. Because nobody else does. Mm. And I knew my mama loved me. I knew my sister loved me. But they were way over there. And I I was going back to nothing. I had no place to live. And they did. And they took me in. And they were so kind to me. And they fed me. And they talked to me about the Lord. And of course, yes, you're right. Yeah, God's great. I love you. Yeah. Um, I didn't sleep in their son's bed. He was out of town. I didn't feel worthy. I said, I'll sleep on the floor. I said, I don't want to dirty your son's bed. They tried to get me to, but I was used to sleeping on the floor. So morning came and they put me in their car and they take me back to the freeway and I head home. Hmm. That's how much God loves you. Parents. Don't ever stop praying. Yes. God loves your children. Mm. So true. So true. There was, uh, I'm sorry. No. (laughs) So time rocked on. We get saved. We get to Georgia. Uh, We went through a rocky place in our marriage and uh, rededicated our lives to the Lord. You know, I'd moved out. She'd moved me out. My daughter was two and a half years old, precious little girl. And I remember during that time I walked outside and when we were going through that and I I just cried out to God. I said, God, no, I can't lose my family. They're all I have. Hmm. And he answered prayer. This lady calls my wife. This is so important. Calls my wife and she says, she, we went to the same church. She goes, I really don't know what's going on over at your house, Debbie, but I want you to know that God loves you and that he wants to restore whatever's broken in your in your life and that he just really cares about you. And she couldn't believe it because she just moved me out the day before. And, uh, and she says, God don't love me. And, 
slammed down the phone. Well, God dealt with her that night. And uh, she came that night and got me. Mm. And so we went back. I thought it was a Saturday. We went back to church that Sunday morning, rededicated our lives to the Lord. Debbie's brother-in-law comes out from California, says uh, he'd been filled with the Holy Spirit. He says there's six people in the church that's going to get baptized in the Holy Spirit, and uh, you two are two of them. Hmm. He gave me a finest Dakes Bible, annotated study Bible, and God's plan for man, and said, read this and get into it. So off Gene goes. So my wife and I start praying. And we we start praying to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. We didn't know. My mama was, and I used to listen to her pray in the Spirit and other tongues. But, you know, we never experienced anything like that. Supernatural manifestation of God, you know. So we just start seeking the Lord. And I worked 14 hours a day, at Gainesville, a long ways away. And we'd come home and we'd pray at night. We pray on the weekends and we just poured our hearts out to God. And man, lo and behold, it's August 5th, 1983, five years exactly to the day that I got, we got saved. We got baptized in the Holy Ghost. Mm. Just a, just a, a point of clarification, because people have asked about baptism in the Holy Spirit uh, versus salvation. So, Okay. Um, okay. The, the salvation uh, is when you receive, confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord. Uh, That's correct. And, uh, ask forgiveness for sins, confessing yeah. of sins, that is, for what he did yeah. on the cross and invite him to become Lord and Savior. The indwelling of the Spirit, the baptism, is uh, similar to what happened in the book of Acts in the early church when the Holy Spirit fell and it filled them and they started speaking yeah. in foreign tongues uh, and they were just filled with the Holy Spirit that went out from yeah. that point uh, as a body of uh, believers in Jesus as our Lord and Savior to yes. now minister in the power of the Holy Spirit. In the heal, power. To yes. heal, to speak forth, uh, you know, prophecy, to teach and all of these other things yes, that we call the spiritual gifts. Yes, that is very true. Perfect. And we started, the word came alive to me. What changed was I read the word and taught Sunday school for those five years. But when I read it now, it came alive. And I started laying hands on the sick and they were recovering. Been doing it ever since. It's been 40 years. They're still recovering. And saw cancers instantly healed. Uh, Deaf ears, just the miracles of God, begin to see it immediately. I didn't know anything about it, but I knew that Jesus said, go do it. And I did, and he did. So, two days later, and this all has to do with the end times. It's right where we're going. Two days later, I'm up in the shower. And... All of a sudden, the, the bathroom fills up with the glory of God. And I'm thinking, somebody's outside the curtain. And I mean, so much. I pulled the curtain back to look. I expected to see an angel or somebody there. And I'm just overwhelmed. And I'm so overwhelmed with the presence of God. I just stopped. And I just, and the Lord says, get out of the shower get your clothes on, go get your wife, go to the prayer room, very specific, and tell me what you want me to do with your life. Hmm. And I said, yes, sir. And man, I mean, I did it exactly like he said. And I grabbed Debbie. I said, well, we got to go pray. And was this an she audible was, voice or was that that? It, that uh, it was, it was, it was. It could have been. I, I'm not going to say it wasn't. Or really, it was so profound. It was so real. It was. It was like. It was just directional. That you know and, that you know. Oh you know, man, there was out. no doubt. Yeah, no doubt about it. And I said, 
let's go. So we go in there and we start worshiping. We put on some worship music and we're praying. And uh, all of a sudden, Brother Randy, out of my mouth comes, Lord, all I want to do is preach your gospel in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And I hear that saying, okay, that I heard when I told God that I would stay on the earth. It was the same, okay. I mean, I can't, can't explain it. Mm. And <laughs> my wife looks at me. She goes, what? And I said, it just come out. The pastor comes over and says, have you been called to preach? Now, he'd asked me about a month before that. And I said, no, I'm not called to preach. No. no. You know, I, I said, but I, knew, I do know that if he does call me, he'll give me the power to do it. And right now, I don't have the power. And that was before the baptism. I didn't put two and two together at that moment. And so he comes over and he says, what's going on over here? He said, I, I just felt really led to come over. He said, and they're not a Pentecostal church. And he said, uh, tell me what's happening. And I said, well, I think God's called me to preach. He said, I knew it. I knew it. So <laughs> he says, how about preaching for me next Sunday? And I said, uh, I've never preached before. He says, oh, you'll be fine. So <laughs> You'll be fine. You'll be fine, right. <laughs> so I got up there, and Brother Randy, now I'll get to my experience with the Lord on the end times, but I got up that Sunday and preached like I'd preached all my life. And I preached on the armor of God. And my wife sat there with her mouth just dropped. She goes, who is that guy? Because I would never get up in front of people. I hated getting up in front of people. I was raised in, on the homestead in a little village, and I never saw anybody, and I did not like being in front of, still don't really like being in front of crowds unless I'm preaching. Then I'm fine. But anyway, so I get up there and preach, and everybody in the place is just shocked. I mean, shocked, okay, because of the way I've always been. I'm just real shy. And so I'm, I get, we get home. I go to work that week and it, and it's Thursday night. It's 2 30 in the morning. And I wake up wide awake. And all of a sudden, just like Acts chapter 10, Peter was in a trance. I felt this power come over me, and it subdued me. And it was like I was in a trance, but my spiritually I was aware, but physically I was just almost frozen. And my ceiling opens up into a beautiful blue and I'm looking, and all of a sudden, to my right, I didn't see the Lord's face. And I start having this vision, and the Lord is showing me, I'm in the vision, and the Lord is showing me drugs and rock and roll, and these strong men over in this section, and a man comes into them and said, it's finally time and there's no stopping this now. It's the end. Hmm. And then the, the, the Lord come and stood by my bright, glistening robe. And, and I look over and I see his hands. And I said, Lord, stupid question, but I was like beside myself. It was like Peter at the transfiguration saying things that just didn't make sense. And I said, Lord, is this vision from you? And he says, yes. Same voice I'd always heard, except very affirming. Yes, this vision is from me. 
I'm showing you what's taking place at the end. My people don't know I'm coming soon. Hmm. They're spiritually unaware. This is 83. And so I saw that and I'm in the vision. All right. And I'm watching. And the next thing I know, I'm standing in a building and industry around the world is just booming. High rises are being made. And I see this man on about the 10th floor. And in the middle of the floor, there is just place a whole floor where they brought all the windows to wrap the building. And every one of them was broke. Mm. Very vivid, very clear. And the superintendent come with super, the foreman come up to the superintendent and said, I've never seen nothing like it. I don't understand it in all my life. I've never seen such needless violence. And this is all happening in your vision. Yes. And all and just like and everything. A so you're having your road to Damascus in a vision sure. of geez, you're seeing Jesus at this time. And yes. And he's right there. I mean, it's right there, just a foot away. And the presence of God is so strong, and I'm watching. And then the next scene comes, and I, my wife and I are in a, like a big mall complex, and everybody's homosexual. And they're so forceful. And they've come out of everywhere, and they've just filled the whole mall. And they see my wife and I, and they come over to make advances towards us. And I grab her hand, and I said, we've got to get out of here. Let's go this way. And, and we came out, and they like pushed up against the door. It was like the Sodom and Gomorrah experience. I mean, it was just amazing. And I'm looking back, and my wife is scared at this point. And so we go out into the parking lot. And as we go out into the parking lot, I see two young men with, with pistols. And they said, we found out that you know and they, about the drug dealer and the, and the rock and roll. We, we, we found out you were there. And they said, we've come to kill you. And so they said, go over here. Well, we went towards this alley and it was real black. And we got over towards the alley and they threw down their guns onto their knees. They fell and they said, can't somebody help us, please? We have no way out. These are the two men I speaking. Said, yeah, the two men were speaking. And, I, and one of them was. And I said, yes, Jesus will help you. In the, in the vision. I, I'm watching all this. And we led him to Christ. And I told Debbie, I said, you take him to safety. When I got up, Brother Randy, I looked to my left down this alley, and all of a sudden it got dark. And I saw my first time ever, I saw my guardian angel. And he had a white robe and he golden hair, golden hair. And he pointed at me and he didn't say anything. He said, he just motioned me to come. And I knew it was okay. And so in the vision, I'm watching this and I go towards him and he goes to this place and it was like a black wall and an oval door, about five feet wide, about four feet high, an oval door opens. And I looked in, and I saw behind it, I saw these flames and these caverns. And he's, he, he goes in. He, it's not, he didn't step in, like he flew in. And he stood on the other side, and he said, come. So when I did, I, I did the same thing. I went in, and when I went in, he went out, and the door shut. Hmm. And I thought, in the vision, I thought, that's strange. And I turn around, and I see 
this huge cavern with with fire, brimstone, molten lava, big things coming down. And I look over to my right and my left, and I see a wall, and it's like you would take clay and you would just mark it with your finger. I know I'm being detailed, but and then three doors open. And out of those doors, these demons opened the doors, all of them, and they each had a hold of that door where it opened. And they said, we have you now. Your angel's gone. Hmm. And I says, no, in the name of Jesus, you do not have me. When I said that, they screamed. And they pull back in, and I could see the outline just like you would take a pencil and draw it in clay of those where those doors were. And so I turned around and I went down into this big cavern. And I got this, this evil feeling. And I look, now all this is, I'm seeing all this. And I look to my right, and there's a big desk like thing and two big levers and on each side of this beam that's pulling I hear this hideous evil low evil laugh and on each side of him were two and that's it's dark it's 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 just really dark but their outline was there and there was two fallen angels about 12 foot tall and I could see the outline of their wings uh, these not all angels have wings. I know that, but these did. And I then I, I saw Lucifer, Satan, the devil. And he he's pulling these levers. And I look again, and all those things were opened back up with a blue screen. And I could see that he was controlling all these evil things of the world. Mm. And then I hear the Lord's voice. Leave now and i felt this urgency to get out from there so i i walk in front of them it's like they don't even see me i walk in front of them and, and then the dream it's over the lord is gone i was so shook up because he had said tell my people that i'm coming soon the end is here mm. And I've endeavored to do that for the last, I'm in my 40th year of ministry. And even though I pastored those years, I would teach on the end times. So when the Lord had me start all over, about six years ago now, and studies, and then finally just give it full time. Uh, and my son's, uh, is also preaching and teaching all the end times at Prophecy Watchers, Mondo Gonzalez. I had him when I was 19. Uh, tremendous story there. So uh, it, he looks exactly like me. I got to see him in 1999, hmm. first. And uh, God called him to preach and so on and so forth. He's not pastoring no more, but he's with my brother Gary Stearman on Prophecy Watchers. And uh, tremendous man of God. He's 48 now. Um, so we are living, when Jesus said in Matthew 24, 37, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. That is so profound in so many ways, and I know we don't have time to talk about that. So I, I've got and I started a Wake Arise and Watch YouTube channel, and I've got it all on there. But we are living in an hour where we're seeing just the last three to four years, there has been such an increase of end time events happening to bring in the very hour of the end. Uh, I mean, I'm really looking up. Yes. <laughs> um, 
he says, you know, when you see all these things, and he was talking about Israel being a nation and all the signs, he said, for your redemption draws nigh. I mean, but to get to the end, the end of that generation and really see what's going on in the world today, if you'll take time to look, okay? And I, I, I try to tell pastors all the time, look, you, you need, I know it's not your ministry. I know you're feeding the sheep, but you need to get somebody or some time in there on the end because prophecy is 25% of the word. We need to know where we're headed. You've got to equip the people to minister to this generation. So there's a, there's a little bit on that. Well, you know, the, um, there's a sense of urgency and I think, um, you know, many believers, and I'll include myself at times, have been kind of laying dormant, you know, going about our ways and being a part-time Christian, so to speak, in a way that, you know, is not fully, uh, you know, fully aware of or cognizant or even yeah. fellowshipping with the Lord when he said, he, his word says that he will never leave us or forsake us, that that, that companionship is is forever. But the sense of urgency you're talking about, Brother Mike, um, from these being the end of times, uh, sounds almost cliche in the context of it what does. people have said over the years, but this is different. This is different. Today is different. And people yes, feel that. Different. People feel yeah. the, the, they feel the, the, the darkness that you had yeah. uh, seen in your vision. Uh, they see the outpouring of uh, all kinds of things from the uh, education to our children to uh, yes. just, and those who are caught in all kinds of uh, uh, sexual, uh, him, uh, you know, mores or what have you, uh, are not feeling good about it and want that escape. And please help they us. Do. We've had people on this program who have, um, it, there's no condemnation of those who are indeed in Christ Jesus. And, right. and that's not what it's about. Right. In your life, uh, Brother Mike, you, the Lord didn't condemn you for that. No, He doesn't condemn. If you're feeling like, like you're caught in something and you just want to be out, you just want to be quote unquote normal, God is not looking for normal. He's looking no. for those who want him and yes. want to be indwelled by his Holy Spirit to free us. Yeah. And we're all captive to something, yeah. something or other. None of us are. Even those who have led, led the uh, proverbial um, wonderful Pollyannish life. Right. You know, mother, father, yeah. you know, live, you know, lived in a nice life and what have you. All of us have fallen short and all of us have yeah. suffered. That is so true. No matter what walk of life, no matter what nationality, rich or poor, we just all are so empty. And uh, only Jesus, only Christ can feel that. Um, it's, it's just the gospel is so powerful. I've watched it operate in the Hindu temples in India, preaching in those temples, some of them 2,000 years old and watching people come in. Uh, I've, had, I've just really been privileged to see the supernatural power of God set people free from every religion, every bondage uh, when they would come to Christ and uh, all different walks of life. Uh, Africa, I've been in some dark places there too. And same thing, wherever your feet go, supernatural power follows. And, and, and it's so important, the church, uh, our individual lives, uh, it's not just going to church, it's being the church outside of the building. Uh, I've walked into people's houses by God just tell me to pull over and see God give a man a new heart, bring him out of a wheelchair, mm. taught them for six months on a Monday night, the word of God, so they can live for Jesus. His wife was a deaf mute. Uh, children got delivered. Mm. This Jesus can fill every void. Yes. It, it is the power of God unto salvation. Yes. 
not just to the Jew first, but to the Gentile, every pagan religion, God will set you free. No matter what God you've served, no matter what those gods have promised, the God of gods, the King of kings comes on the scene and he sets you free. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Amen. It's about that, isn't it? Freedom. It is. And it's uh, so many uh, are, and I was for a number of years, like the frog yeah. in the uh, boiling pot, you know, they just, uh, the heat is turned up and after a while I don't realize that you're oh. being cooked to death yes. until you're freed, you know, jumping yeah. out and all of a sudden you realize, oh, all the all this time I was held captive, all this time I thought Didn't I was know. being made freed by this or that and, <laughs> I, you know, and it hasn't, it just is cooking us to death. And well, religion will do that. Religion will do that. There's only one religion that actually explained, described in the Bible that was a good religion, and that was to the uh, widows and those who were yeah. abandoned. Uh, that was good. religion yeah. because religion yeah. was religion wasn't uh, described at that you point. The bondage. Yes, yes. That's right. It was that was religion <laughs> by being by 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 helping those. Yeah by actually being that person that you had described that picked you up and was obedient to the Lord on the side of the road. You didn't want to sleep and the, uh, be under the bridge and they were obedient. That's right. That's religion. Yes. That's good religion. Bad religion yes, is, is accusing Amen. and saying you're going, you're, you may be going, <laughs> there were some that are maybe going to hell, but we don't want you. God doesn't want you to go to hell. He wants to save you. And you're watching this yes, right now does. and you are uh, thinking, well, there is no hell. We've had people on this show uh, Brother Mike, who have been there, they've been there, uh, and they testify of the of this place, and they yes. they came back to tell people God doesn't want you to go there. Doesn't He didn't? When you faced that uh, that demon who said, "Okay, I've been called to take you into into hell," and you, you yeah. had Satan in your vision speaking, declaring to you, and seeing uh, Satan in the control of what's going on, uh, God doesn't want any of that. Oh, he's exposing oh. it to That's allow right. us to uh, to come to him and to receive him as our Lord and Savior. So, uh, thank you so, so much for sharing, uh, Brother Mike. Where mm -hmm. can uh, where can we get uh, in touch with you and your ministry? Well, uh, we are we live in Clarksville, Georgia, and uh, eighteen eighty seven Dooley Road. Uh, Awake, Arise, and Watch uh, is my YouTube channel. I, I'm still on Facebook. Uh, you can friend me at Mike Carute, and uh, I'll accept your friendship. You can watch me. And then WFBN uh, uh, Network, uh, I'm on there Thursday and Friday from 4.30 to 5, and uh, sometimes on Saturday. And I'm not sure of the time of that right now. That That's just into working. And uh, that's where I am, or pastor at tnlw.org. And uh, get in touch with me. Uh, yes, by all means. We can, we'll can. we have, by the way, if you didn't write that down or remember it, it's in the body of this, uh, uh, of this message that you're hearing or, or seeing. So just make sure to go to the body. There are links. Uh, to where you can fi find uh, Brother Mike. Uh, you'll see the spelling of his name. You'll see the uh, connection to where he is ministering and uh, and some of the prophetic uh, that he has in terms of the end times ministry that both he and his wife are uh, yes. are doing. So my uh, time and again, uh, one of my favorite times of these uh, wonderful life-changing get-togethers uh, Brother Mike is the opportunity to pray for people, and uh, sometimes the Lord will prompt me um, virtually every time as to how we should pray. And uh, I'll hand it over to some of our guests to do as I'm going to hand it back over to you, Brother Mike. Uh, for those who are caught in some form of bondage, or whether it be alcoholism, whether it be you know just some form, and and there are those who are again living these quote unquote Pollyannish lives that there's something secret going on that for the deliverance to live in that freedom that God calls us to. So would you uh, 
Would you uh, be willing to pray for us, uh, Brother Mike, uh, to Absolutely. set the captives free? Absolutely. Be an honor. Let's pray. Today is your day of freedom. Today is the day that you can come to the kingdom of God. No matter the bondage, the depth, God's hand is not short that he cannot save. No matter how deep you are, he hears your cry. No matter what you've done, he is willing to redeem and to wash you in his blood. You have to ask. You don't have to ask perfectly. You don't have to pray the perfect prayer. But out of your heart, you must cry out, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and set me free. And the Lord is faithful. I pray for those that are in bondage to alcoholism. I pray for you right now in the name of Jesus. I take authority over that spirit of bondage and addiction. I command that thing to release and remove itself from you today. Yes. In Jesus' name. Yes. Those who are bound by various sicknesses and diseases. Yes. The Lord has given us power to heal every manner of sickness and every manner of disease among the people. Yes. I pray for infirmities to release you, spirit of cancer. Yes. I curse you in Jesus' name. Yes. Remove yourself from that person as they cry out to God right now. Yes. In the name of Jesus, Lord, I pray that every evil work There's someone out there that it just seems lately that every way you've turned, something evil has been present to draw you away from the living God. In the name of Jesus, I break its power right now. I command that spirit from hell to remove itself from your life. Yes. You must cry out right now, Jesus. Deliver me from this evil, yes. and he will hear you today. Yes. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord. Father, that person with that cast on and his left foot, big toe, and the one next to it, where it was just crushed, and the doctors really don't give any hope. They didn't amputate, but they wanted to. I want you to know right now in the name of Jesus, I command those toes to be healed. I command you to come out of that cast in Jesus' name. Yes. Thank him for thank it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Lord. Whoever you are, just thank him for it. Thank you. I've never, I've, I've never seen that particular word before but I can see your foot I can I can see it yes and I see God's healing power fixing it yes in the name of Jesus today is your day for salvation if you are not born again I want you to pray with me say Lord Jesus come into my heart come into my life I choose to make you Lord I give my life to you. Change me. Give me new life, Lord. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. I know there may be a, a lot of oppression around you. A lot of oppressiveness. Maybe coming from your government. Maybe just coming from the community you live in. Maybe your job, but I pray for those under a lot of oppression. Yes. Where it's just trying to strangle the life out of you and cause your spirit to despair. And when despair comes, you become despondent. Yes. But I say in the name of Jesus, I remove that oppression from you. Freedom. Yes. Yes. Freedom. Freedom. And Lord, 
I'm asking you to pour your spirit out and just liberate these people today by the power of the Holy Spirit, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. That was a kingdom prayer. Uh, you have the connection information again in the body of this message to contact Brother Mike, Pastor Mike, and uh, in his ministering. You can also go to randyk.org uh, to uh, if you have a message uh, that you would like to relate to him. Uh, you can do so there or any other information that is on our site. You can reference it there as well, including uh, the links to all of our interviews. Uh, and thank you so much for joining us today. And Brother Mike, uh, this has been uh, life-changing, and I know a lot of people have been set free uh, today. Yes. Thank you for what you do. You, I watch some of your shows, and so refreshing, so good. Thank you for being obedient and letting the Lord use you and your wife and all that you're doing. You're in our prayers. God bless. And God bless you, Brother Mike, you and your wife. And uh, your wife's name, we didn't mention her. Debbie. Debbie. Yes. No, we did mention her. What am I thinking? Yes, about? he did. That yes. was prophetic. He knew, you knew that you were going to marry a Debbie before you met a Debbie. So uh, He's quite yeah. the prophetic lady. <laughs> so thank you for that. And we have some great news um, for those who are indeed in Christ Jesus and you have been set free. Uh, the great news is that heaven is in your future. Until next time, Amen. take care yes, and God All bless. Right. God bless. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for listening. Please like and subscribe. And if you'd like further information, go to our website at randyk.org, where our mission is simple, to share the great news of God's love.